Thank you, everyone. Um, we're very, very excited about this webinar. Now, just as I begin, could I firstly thank the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're all meeting and recognise that these lands have always been places of learning. I'd like to pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have played in responding to domestic and family violence. I'll now, um, just before I hand over to Betty, where you're all eagerly waiting, and can I tell you that this webinar had such great interest, we had to close off numbers where there's an upper limit of 500 and we actually reached that. So we are thrilled that this topic, this all important topic on strangulation has resonated and people are, are, are tuning in to know more. Now, I'll just give you a little of Betty's bio. Um, Betty has worked across the DV sector for the past 28 years, being the founding manager of the Gold Coast Domestic Violence Prevention Centre and overseeing the DV uh, integrated response there. She chaired the Queensland Domestic Violence Council for two terms, has been an active member on the domestic Violence Death Review Action Group since its formation in 2004. And I won't go into how many uh, committees and um, advice Betty's been called on to give over time. Betty's also written several training manuals and course material. Um, Betty was rightly awarded Churchill Fellowship and Centenary Medal in recognition of her work in this field. And she's a current member of the Child Death Review Panel and the Domestic Violence Death Review Board. She is also, as you all know, I think, she is the CEO of the Red Rose Foundation that is really calling all of us to know more about non-lethal strangulation and what it means. So without further ado, I will turn to Betty Thank you, Heather, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, would you believe this is my first webinar? I've never, I'm, I'm a trainer, so I'm used to working in a much more interactive way than just sitting here talking to myself, literally. Um, but the Red Rose Foundation, um, we're primarily focused on um, the prevention of all domestic violence deaths. <clears throat> we're a national board. And I guess where we come from is recognising that so many of these deaths are both pre predictable and preventable. And that's rather tragic. <clears throat> we started to campaign for specific domestic violence, non-lethal strangulation almost 15 years ago. And we were pleased when that was achieved through not now, not ever. Queensland's the only state in Australia that has specific domestic violence strangulation legislation. And we continue to focus on these deaths through training forums, conferences, but importantly, remembering women have died, that they aren't statistics. They are much loved family members. <clears throat> they are women predominantly who um, we can learn so much from. And I think that we honour those who died by learning and committing ourselves to know more. Um, I want to acknowledge that this presentation and the work we do at the Red Rose Foundation has been hugely influenced by Gail Strack, Casey Gwynn and Dr Bill Smock from the US Strangulation um, Prevention and Training Institute. Um, Gail and Bill have been over to Australia two years in a row and they'll be back next month um, <clears throat> providing training in Brisbane, Melbourne and Perth. They are the ones that have put this issue to the forefront globally and tireless in their work. So I honour them and um, just want to acknowledge this work that well, what you're seeing today is underpinned by their learnings. I also want to put out a caution that domestic violence and family violence is so prevalent across our communities 
And as um, Heather said, you know, with almost 500 registered for this webinar, there will be people um, that this is close to. They could be affected by this themselves within their family, close friends. And the talk today will focus on strangulation, homicide and sexual violence, all topics that can be triggering. If this is for you or happens to you, please seek support from your workplace or from DV Connect. Um, I also wanted to say that I have removed any images um, you know, that I may use in training. I wanted to remove them because um, without knowing who's, who's out there, um, I didn't want to be stressing people. <clears throat> But I do want to put um, strangulation into the context more broadly of domestic violence, that um, it is one of the forms of violence that sit along and coexist with sexual violence, threats, ab emotional abuse, um, verbal abuse, physical abuse, um, and other forms of um, behaviour, that it's not just going to sit out there on its own. Um, this is the description of domestic violence or how it's defined in the Domestic and Family Violence Protection Act. It's a behaviour perpetrated by one person against another where two people are in a relevant relationship, which is physically, sexually abusive, emotionally, psychologically abusive, economically abusive, threatening, coercive, or any way controls or dominates the victim and causes that victim to live in fear for their own or someone else's safety and wellbeing. <clears throat> Certainly, um, strangulation fits within that, and particularly when, when we start to talk about fearing for your own um, your own lives and well-being, it's very to the forefront. The prevalence we know that domestic violence is predominantly um, perpetrated against women. Yes, men can be victims, but one in three Australian women will experience violence um, since the age of fifteen. One in five will experience sexual violence and one in 15 men will experience some form of sexual violence. Women are three times more likely to, than men to experience intimate partner violence and they're one in five times more likely to seek hospitalisation because of injuries. The statistics for Aboriginal women are more dire we know that Aboriginal women are 35 times more likely to be hospitalised as a result of family or domestic violence. That they are 23 times more likely to experience violence across their lifespan than non-Indigenous women. Um, all domestic violence isn't the same. That when we're talking about domestic violence and talking about um, homicides, attempted homicides and serious injury, we know that there are predominant risk factors. We know that those risk factors um, combined together can put um, women at really serious risk. So while today we're talking about non-lethal strangulation, we also need to keep in mind that these factors are also important that if women are talking about separating, whether it's actual or, they have, <coughs> or it's pending, stalking, whether it's stalking a, a person um, prior to the relationship breakup, whether it's in person or online, it doesn't matter. That perpetrators, there's a lot of focus on that online stalking, but from my experience talking to women, it moves from one to the other all the time and quite quickly. Intimate partner sexual violence, I'll be talking about soon. Escalation that includes threats to kill, threats to suicide of a partner and coercive control. So we're going to be talking about um, non-lethal strangulation. Um, I just want to quote something from the, sorry for the glasses, the uh, US National uh, Mortality Survey of almost 23 people over the age of 15 um, who died of strangulation in, in any uh, relationship setting. And this found that women were 11.8 times um, more prevalent in strangulations 
than men at 1.9 across every single age group. They were homicides that happened well outside of a family um, or an intimate relationship. So it is a gendered crime, both in um, the realms of public and in the realms of private, that when women die um, in the public, um, you, we've had some high profile cases of um, women being sexually assaulted and murdered, and it's often in, going to include strangulation. Uh, Gail Strack and Casey Green call it on the edge of homicide, that when uh, someone is um, strangling a person, that they are a very, very dangerous um, offender. That <clears throat> the difference between uh, strangulation in an intimate relationship and in the public is that many victims of domestic violence experience strangulation repeatedly. And I'll be talking a little bit later about the impact on them and the harm it's, it's doing to them. Um, and Dr. Uh, Dean Hawley talks about it as the ultimate form of a, um, extreme coercive control, where someone is saying to another person, I can decide at any time whether you live or whether you die. Um, <clears throat> the definition, the several definitions, um, Dr. Dean Hawley talks about it as a form of asphyxia characterised by the closure of blood vessels and air passages of the neck as a result of external pressure on the neck. That um, it doesn't take a lot of pressure um, for someone to die and they can do that quite quickly. They can go become unconscious within seconds and die within minutes. The continuous pressure and closure of the vascular or respiratory structures, um, victims can rapidly progress to unconsciousness due to that decreased um, flow of oxygen to the brain. Um, <clears throat> their death uh, can occur days or weeks though later, often that it's not necessarily that a person dies immediately. They can die due to uh, carotid artery dissection and res respiratory complications such as pneumonia, etc. But the big risk is risk of blood clots that can travel. Um, we do know of women that have died uh, um, from strokes post strangulation. And Dr. Bill Smop um, tells us that from the research they've done in the US, that in a healthy woman under the age of 40, um, with no other symptomology, that uh, strangulation will be the biggest cause of a stroke. They, um, <clears throat> across their lifespan, when the more strangulation um, events a woman experiences, the increase of death um, rapidly escalates. And we know that 35% of strangulation victims are strangled during a sexual assault. So the co-occurrence co of those things is really high. So in your work, if you're talking to women about strangulation, um, make sure it's on your radar that those women also could have been raped. And if you're working with rape um, survivors, be asking about um, strangulation. Um, Manual strangulation is the most often used method in an intimate uh, relationship, although there can be ligature, scarves, um, cords, telephone cords, etc. But in the study done by uh, Gail Stroke and Casey Gwynn, 90% of the women, 90% said their partner had used their hand. They'd used either both hands or one hand, um, with only 3% saying it was a ligature. Keeping in mind that while that image is a front on strangulation, it could be someone grabbing the neck from behind and pressing hard, or it could be side on. It doesn't need to be two hands to the front. Um, again, in the research that Gail and Casey did, 40% uh, of the cases, there was thr prior threats to kill. So again, someone is really serious. Um, we know about the police car restraint um, and some domestic violence perpetrators will use this as well. 
But what we um, <coughs> have since learnt um, in America that there are police training institutes that are now banning this type of training after um, either recruit or even a police trainer died. That's how serious it is. So it's, um, you know, it's used often to render someone unconscious, but if you're rendering someone unconscious, <clears throat> then you need to know that you've only got seconds to um, stop what you're doing so that they can actually um, regain that consciousness. And in the end, you don't know, even when they become conscious, what's gone on for them. Um, women have, um, you know, talked about all of the um, effects that it has on them, that they're, um, when, if they've been unconscious, when they come to, you know, just the things that are going uh, on for them. Um, these four, we talked before about high risk indicators, but these four markers are really um, what research is showing around what can lead to a homicide. If there are prior threats to kill, someone's going to be 14.9% more likely those threats are going to be killed, uh, taken, um, sorry, carried out. Um, sometimes those threats are rehearsed and sometimes they're not. Um, prior attempts to strangle, they're almost 10 times more likely they're going to die. Just on the strangulation, um, it's only just coming now into our collective <coughs> knowledge here in Queensland since the Act came in and it's been coming more do better documented. But from the death review report last year, um, it, prior strangulations was evident in 28% of cases. Um, someone doesn't need to die from strangulation for it to be an issue, but they could die from other means, stabbing, bashings, etc. But in most homicides, it's going to be present there. Rape is 7.6 times more likely someone's going to die from rape in an in a intimate setting and that uh, ultimate control over everyone's daily activities and that's what makes it so difficult <clears throat> for women to leave, to get help, um, to actually plan to be safe is when there's that ultimate act of control. Where the strangulation, um, I would hazard a guess to say all of those things will be present and certainly to be mindful that um, you're focusing on pulling out those things and asking about them. Um, this is from a, a strangulation that happened in Warwick and um, the, the woman survived this but she felt that, um, well she said she felt she was going to die when he wrapped his hands around her neck and choked her. Um, the only reason probably that she did survive this was he um, hit his head on a cupboard and um, that's what they're saying, he stopped. Um, in the, um, there was research done by Nancy Glass at Chicago University, uh, sorry, Chicago Hospital. And in that research, 70% of women said when their husband or partner was strangling them, they believed they were going to die, 70%. Um, and they believed that their partner was serious about killing them. They didn't believe that this was an out of control action. They believed that um, they were, he was quite serious about them dying. 38% of the women in that study had lost consciousness. Um, they also found that strangulation is also coupled with higher levels of extreme physical violence. So women were presenting to hospital with stab wounds um, from and bashings and other broken limbs and other serious forms of the result of physical violence and the strangulation was picked up in the context of it. So again, a, a strangler, as I call them, is a really serious offender that will commit other forms of violence. Um, just on that too, I wanted to say, you know, that keep repeating that um, the thing about stranglers too, you know, we've all seen movies and, and different other things about the Boston Strangler and um, 
you know, strangling these victims and, and, and raping them. And um, there's been correlation um, that, you know, a domestic violence um, perpetrator um, is in that category. The difference is someone like the Boston Strangler um, just went around strangling and killing a lot of different women where a domestic violence perpetrator is, is focused primarily on his one victim. Um, I've put up the um, link at the top there to the Strangulation Training Institute at San Diego, where Gail Strake is based, um, that I've got two different cards um, here. Um, if you go to that website and you'll be able to um, find their resources and these cards are there. Um, the signs though to look for particularly, well, not just in a medical setting, but for anyone, but particularly in a medical setting is the red eyes or, or spotting around the face. Um, that can be in the ears, the mouth, through the hairline, um, you know, showing, I guess, those broken capillaries. Neck swelling, um, I did have a photo in here of one of the women that um, we've been supporting, um, that it, a photo was taken of her at hos in a local hospital here um, and showed her neck um, with redness in it. Um, the redness wasn't that pronounced and slight swelling. And the next day her, her neck was quite large um, from edema and we sent her back to hospital. Um, in some of the jurisdictions in the states where they've really got on top of this, <clears throat> the police will go back the next day with a tape measure and measure the neck. And it helps them, I guess, document better what's going on, but making sure women are getting to um, the medical attention when they need. So while women might present to a hospital or a, a medical GP, and it may not look like there's a lot of um, things to go on, make sure you actually book them in for a follow-up to uh, monitor any of these things. And I'll talk about a discharge um, plan in a minute. Um, they may have nausea and vomiting. They may be unsteady on their feet. And we've had um, women where um, it's been treated like she's drunk. She's slurring her speech. She's quite unsteady on her feet. Um, she has that lapse of memory. Um, the memory can be very distorted. Um, and often for women, that lapse of memory is actually quite um, traumatising for them. And that can be one of the factors that make it quite difficult to be giving statements to police or even a, a, a chronological um, timeline of events to medical practitioners. That, um, you know, if someone's been unconscious, they're not going to remember what happened. And often that in itself is the trauma. Um, that, or the memory comes back um, slowly so it may be days later that they're starting to remember. And um, we've had women that have gone back to police and saying, now I'm starting to remember this and I'm starting to remember that. And there's been a fairly large discounting of that about, well, how come you didn't remember it earlier? Um, there may be uh, urination and defecation. And as Dr. Bill says again, you know, that is, um, symptomatic of the um, body shutting down. We need to be asking women that. They may be really embarrassed about that. Um, again, that can be <clears throat> dismissed as um, anxiety or stress on the occasion, but it needs to be taken seriously and documented. Um, loss of consciousness can be um, for particularly, I guess, for police and first responders about, you know, if a woman is found on the floor, um, if she's got injuries um, consistent with passing out and being in her head or other parts of the body as she collapsed are all things that she may have actually been um, unconscious. It can be, <coughs> excuse me, uh, droopy eyelids, um, droopy face, um, 
seizures, um, seizures, um, particularly post strangulation. You know, one of the things that that we're wanting to do is uh, a medical follow up of women for up to six months post strangulation because some of these things only um, come to light um, down the track. They're not always um, evident. Tongue injury, lip injury. Um, in that news report from the woman in Warwick, you know, she had um, lip injuries. Um, medical status changes and some women, you know, the confusion often doesn't leave them, you know, the voice changes. Uh, one woman reported that she was a singer and now she can't sing because of, of a voice. Another woman that we're supporting has damage to her vocal cords. Um, so symptoms, you know, you're looking for neck and joint pain. Um, you know, any pain from head pulling, sore throat, difficulty breathing, swallowing, any visual changes, um, you know, tunnel vision, flashing lights, and often <coughs> visual, um, their sight can actually be something, their sight and hearing can be affected well and truly light, uh, into the future. Lightheadedness, headaches, weakness, um, and voice changes. And they're, um, you know, spelling out that strangle, you know, the scene and safety, um, taking it in, what's going on. Trauma for the victim, you know, what did they remember? And it doesn't matter if it's not in the right sequence, you know, it's actually getting them to recall what they can remember. Um, it's reassuring them and calling in resources is so important, <clears throat> knowing who's there to help. You know, assessing them um, and looking for um, signs that, that has been strangulation, even if that's not what they're reporting. I just wanted to say on strangulation too, it's the language we're using now. Previously, we used to say choking and we know it's not choking, someone chokes on a fishbone or something. But again, in the uh, one of the studies I was reading from overseas is that women themselves talk about choking and they see strangulation as something that is done with a ligature. No, he didn't strangle me, he was trying to choke me. So if they're not con um, if they're not obeying with what strangulation is and they're using choking, go with that because that might be where they're at. Okay, this is just again from their website, but like talking about, um, you know, 70% they thought that they were um, going to die. They really thought that this was it, they were going to die. Um, and 68% of women that may experience strangulation. 38% that could lose, um, lose consciousness. The difficulty with it is often there's no external signs of injury. So the work that uh, Gail and Bill are doing um, is they're doing a lot of work around the medical testing, whether someone needs, um, you know, a CT angiogram um, and other medical tests to, to see if um, strangulation has occurred. We're currently working on a project at the moment too with the Queensland Ambulance to make sure when they attend a strangulation, you know, what what are they looking for as well. Um, the thing with um, when someone um, has been unconscious or post-concussion is that the symptoms can last for six months or more. You know, a specific study from Wilson looked at, um, you know, the follow-up report, you know, that there's often new sim symptoms that can appear at three months um, and six months and some reporting them at um, one year. So the symptoms may not necessarily come to light immediately. Uh, the woman that we are supporting with um, damaged vocal cords, it's now one year since the strangulation. I um, <clears throat> wanted to talk just a moment about traumatic brain injury and strangulation. It's often referred to as a silent epidemic and it's often looked as a domestic violence survivor injury. The types of brain injury relating to domestic violence are categorised as traumatic brain injury, 
which is the blow to the head, shaking, slamming into walls, pushing down a flight of stairs, or um, anoxic, a hypoxic brain injury, um, looking at the depleted levels um, of oxygen to the brain, and they can result from strangulation, tracheal compression, suffocation, and attempted drowning. Women in domestic violence may suffer um, traumatic brain injury both ways. They may suffer um, being banged into walls, etc., but also the anoxic and hypoxic brain injury from strangulation. <clears throat> Many women who've been strangled can be thrown into a wall, they can be bashed against a wall, they can be uh, pinned against a wall, and some women are actually elevated off the ground um, by their partner's hands as he's strangling them. Other places that women are experiencing strangulation um, though are on um, in the bedroom and on couches, which is a strong indicator of um, sexual violence. Just checking out time. Um, I guess the, the impact on, on memory is really um, huge that um, when someone um, has both a trauma and both you know, physical trauma that um, you know the memory stored in the hippocampus is can be damaged and that they may start to recall that or some will never recall it. And that can be, as I said, quite um, disturbing for women. <clears throat> it can be disturbing getting the memories back and it can be disturbing not having those memories at all which is going to make prosecutions a lot, a lot harder if they don't have that. Um, yeah, look, I hate getting flashbacks from things I don't want to remember. And, um, you know, that's often quite difficult as well. Um, the, another study um, out of the States was called I Didn't Know I Could Turn Colours. And it was actually based on focus groups with women as survivors of strangulation. We don't have um, a lot of research in Australia and we're hoping that we'll be able to work with CQU who are hosting this event today and um, but Gartstrack as well, that we can actually start to talk to survivors of strangulation to look at what their experiences are here in Queensland that might help shape how we move forward. But there, this study from 2012 found that 84% of victims in that study had experienced multiple strangulations. It wasn't just one, it was, a, it was continuous. Um, bear in mind, this is a group of people who had all experienced strangulation. So out of those, there's only 16% where it was a one-off. 82% had lost consciousness. 25% tragically were strangled during pregnancy. And out of that 25%, 5% um, it resulted in a miscarriage within 24 to 48 hours post the strangulation. So for women that are pregnant, strangulation is, is again, you know, it's, it's that double risk factor. Some of the things that women have said themselves about strangulation is one woman said, um, I saw stars when I passed out, when I come to, he was on top of me, banging my head against the kitchen floor. He was strangling me. Actually, when I come out of it, the strangulation incident, I was more submissive. I was more terrified that the next time I might not make it. Another woman, I was trying to get away. He grabbed me and spun me around. He started to choke me, brought me down to the ground at the same time he was trying to choke me and hit my head on some rocks. This came on to the Red Rose Foundation um, Facebook page. It's what someone sent us that this woman is saying, you know, he was strangling and smothering, so using both. And to this day, she can't wear a scarf. She believed he'd eventually cure. Um, 
you know, we've talked about, you know, some of the symptoms and with that memory loss too, I need to say, please keep in mind that a lot of women can experience post-traumatic stress disorder. They've gone through a very um, life-threatening incident and it will um, have a profound impact on them mentally and psychologically. Um, for um, people working in the health um, arena, um, we would say that someone needs to be with that person for the next 24 to 72 hours post an event. It, health complications can <clears throat> develop quickly um, and they need to be either calling triple O for an ambulance or getting to an emergency facility. If they have any problems breathing, um, difficulty breathing, lying down, shortness of breath, cough, coughing up blood, passing out. Uh, one of our homicides that we reviewed, she did have strangulation um, that probably wasn't responded to the best way it could be. She continued to pass out several times through the day. Any changes in voice or difficulty speaking, swallowing, lump in throat, muscle spasms, Again, that swelling in the throat, neck or tongue, neck pain, left or side weakness, numbness and tingling, drooping eyelids and difficulty speaking or understanding, difficulty often hearing what's going on. Um, um, yeah, headaches that aren't relieved by medication, headaches that stay there, dizziness, lightheadedness, any changes in vision. Um, and again, that particular with the burst blood vessels in the eye affecting that. Um, any behavioural change, you know, not just memory loss, but confused, being in a confused state, um, heightened anxiety, it could be um, becoming quite angry, you know, reason not knowing what's going on. Thoughts of harming themselves or others, but particularly if someone is pregnant, they really need to um, be monitored very, very closely post strangulation. For any decrease in movement of the baby, vaginal spotting or bleeding, abdominal pain, contractions. Um, we would say that the follow up post strangulation needs to be you know, documented. I think that women who experience post strangulation need to know this. I think they know, need to know um, the seriousness of what's occurred. We are getting reports from women now where they are hearing that um, from doctors and ED nurses that they are told to have someone with them to watch what's going on. Um, if there's a lot of confusion, then maybe whoever's going to be staying with them, ask them to note down their observations because if they're going back, that person may not have the recall to do that. Again, to um, wherever you work um, in getting better prosecutions for strangulation, um, your documentation of this could be vitally important. I um, hadn't mentioned about um, photographs, but ensuring that any photographs taken will comply with the Evidence Act and how that's kept and stored. But, you know, a picture tells a thousand words. Um, we had a woman send us a photograph of the, the injuries around the neck, but one of the important things was she was holding up her hand and all her fingers were badly bruised and whatever. And that was where she'd actually been scratching at her partner to get him away from her. And obviously the evidence under her fingernails was crucial. So that is the section in the um, the criminal code. It's a, a specific piece of legislation relating to um, non-lethal strangulation. It's a criminal offence with a upper sentencing limit of um, five years. This is the data up until um, the, the 31st of December 2018. So. That's why it looks a bit low, it's only six months. So on average, it's about 830 
they ran the 800 um, charges have gone to the magistrates court um, because it's an indictable offence it goes up to the district court um, I believe the ones that went to the Supreme Court there was um, corresponding serious charges coupled with those this is the outcome um, where there was a conviction so 450 received various um, lengths of sentencing imprisonment five on um, custody with the community, 13 in probation and five others. And um, just um, finishing up with um, that, we have uh, formed a, a partnership under the Red Rose Foundation with the Strangulation Prevention Institute of the US. And these are our diary dates for their training coming up in next month, Brisbane, Melbourne, Perth. It's two day intensive. What I've given you is just a very brief, brief overview of about the seriousness of strangulation and some tips of what people can do. Um, but Gail is a law professor and a prosecutor and she can, um, I guess, teach how people can build their cases. And ben, Bill is a forensic um, medical officer with the St. Louis Police Department and he travels the world now specialising in strangulation prevention. Thank you, everyone. So we've got a couple of uh, questions coming through and please, everyone, um, I've got one eye on the uh, chat uh, box on the other screen. So if you have some questions, please pass them through to me. Uh, so one of the questions we have, Betty, is are forensic nurses in hospitals currently trained in identifying strangulation? Um, there has been training that's gone through Queensland Health. I'm myself not sure to the extent of it. Um, and we know that last year there was um, nurses that came to our training. So um, in a short answer, um, I think there's some, but I don't know if it's robust enough that they've got, um, you know, a solid plan of how they'll respond to this. Okay, thanks for that. Um, another question would be, is there a kind of rule of thumb as to how long we should tell women to continue to be medic medically monitored? You spoke there about um, the 70, 72 hours being critical, but um, is it a pre presentation of particular new symptoms or do we tell women to keep going back to a doctor for a set period of time? Um, ideally, um it's six months. If, if particularly if women have been unconscious, I think that they need to um, have that follow up to make sure that everything's okay for them. That you know symptoms may not arise until um, several months after. I meant to say with stroking, um, what the US research is showing that strokes can occur anywhere up to twelve months post strangulation, but the average is four months. So it's a fair, fair amount of time for someone to still be able to be in danger. If they're getting the right um, medical testing, that should show a lot earlier, but that was the average time for strokes. So have you, have you seen much improvement in the police response uh, over the last few years since it became um, uh, since it started to be taken more seriously, I suppose. Um, so the question's about police responses. Um, I think that um, these charges are showing that the police are taking it seriously and responding. Um, I, but we still hear from women that that often is um, not uniform. I think some police are really picking it up and going with it. I think there may be um, room for improvement. But what's concerning us now is that we don't have a body of people trained to be uh, give expert testimony. And when Gail and Bill over, we'll be talking about that because what's happening now is in um, the lack of getting a whole lot of evidence, some of those charges, or quite a lot actually, are getting plea bargaining down to lesser offences and that's not why we wanted that legislation brought in in the first place. 
Um, okay, so there's another question comes through. Um, are there long-term effects that impact cognitive functioning, meaning years down the track? Yes, it can be, but without, again, without the research <clears throat> to back it up. But from that piece of research that I was quoting from America, just generally around concussion and brain injury, yes, of course, there can be. And if someone um, has, uh, you know, a cerebral hemorrhage, it's going to affect them um, for, you know, the rest of their lives. But um, cognitively, uh, you know, we, we've only been working here in Queensland with women for the past year. And the women that we're talking about certainly still have the effects of post-traumatic stress disorder where they are, you know, the, the memory is still impacted on their ability to remember and recall. And one woman was even talking about the, um, you know, doing some um, simple tasks that she could do before now become quite um, difficult to do. Uh, so we ha yeah, have another question here saying, um, so, you know, it's fantastic that this, this information and training has been uh, rolled out for those of us in the industry. Is this um, trickling down to, I know, respectful relationships education in schools? Um, I, in a short answer, I'm not sure of that. I think that the respectful relationship training that goes on in the schools is a lot more broad than high risk domestic violence. I think it's about how um, young people form those relationships in the first place. So you're avoid, avoiding all this tragically. By the time we get to this high end violence, you know, they're in a relationship that's fraught with some pretty serious behaviours. So there was a, another question, which is probably in the same vein around whether there's much research on strangulation of uh, children and young people of um, in these domestically violent homes? Um, you know, sadly, I looked into strangulation with children and, and uh, only found uh, a few pieces on that. But yes, yeah, certainly it's an issue and it's an issue that needs to be picked up um, around child protection. It, um, is it contained within the domestic violence um, a specific piece of legislation that we've got here? Um, it, but it becomes a, quite a serious, um, <coughs> quite a serious child protection issue, and it will only be picked up, I guess, through um, the medical um, interventions that would identify. I've got a, another question here saying, do you have any tips for hospital staff when it comes to encouraging women to report these events to police? This comes from a doctor in an emergency department who finds it frustrating and upsetting that when the woman says she doesn't want police involved. Um, so this is about um, encouraging women to report coming from out of ED. Um, and thank you to the doctor for that. Um, because it is it is a um, an issue that, but I guess whether someone reports this or not, it's about they're there in that ED and how you take that safety seriously. So you know it's calling in the resources at your disposal, whether it's your social work department um, or an external domestic violence uh, agency that might be able to support that woman um, through this. But like we know for women reporting to police is often fraught with its own um, dangers. They're not sure what the consequences might be, if that's going to be taken um, seriously, is it going to make it worse? But if you've got someone there, it's doing everything that you can around their safety. And for an ED, I'd be talking about calling in um, the social work department to assist. Um, okay, and again, in a kind of similar vein, we have a, uh, a question here. We have a number of clients who are reporting that they've informed police about strangulation. However, these charges are not being pursued because they didn't lose consciousness or they can't recall what exactly has occurred. Um, do you have um, any yeah, advice around that situation? So the questions about um, re women who are reporting to police not being taken seriously, Mm. because 
Am I right, Tree, saying that uh, they can't recall? Yes, or that that's they right. Or consciousness. So it's the two things. Yeah. If yeah. they can't recall, again, we had a woman that um, the police asked her, had she been unconscious? And she said, I don't remember. And he said, well, you mustn't have been or you remember. And I'm saying, no, the fact that you can't remember is a high probability you were. So if women can't remember what's happened to them, I think the balance of um, possibilities is that she was unconscious. But whether someone's unconscious or not, it's the act of strangulation that's the offence. It's not the, the unconsciousness that's the offence. So women don't have to be unconscious for this to be taken seriously. What um, the police need to, I guess, be looking at is how they document that but referring women on to for medical examinations and um, other supports as well to get that documentation. But the police are bound to investigate this and um, to take those charges. It is it is a crime and it needs to be taken more seriously as that. Uh, we've got a few questions here uh, uh, asking for a bit more information on the effect on unborn babies. Okay. Um, the effect on unborn is like Gail's um, research, uh, Gail Strack, 25% of women were pregnant. Um, and I guess the, the uh, again, is whether someone was unconscious or not, the, the um, lack of oxygen to, um, to the brain and the um, harm that that would do to a baby. I'd be encouraging, um, I'd certainly be encouraging women that might present at um, an ED that are pregnant to actually also be talking to um, their antenatal doctors or midwives about strangulation and getting scans and um, tests done to make sure that baby's healthy. I have, have a question. Uh, requesting some tips for child safety staff on working with women who've been strangled. They're often reluctant to engage with us during to, due to the nature of our work. Um, I guess that's a that's the, the big question, isn't it, for child safety, is um, that the engagement or non-engagement of women out of domestic violence more broadly of how um, women, you know, perceive <coughs> what's going on for them and, and how they're going to get those supports. Um, it's so problematic that women uh, all the time weighing up causes and consequences. I think the causes and consequences for women in reporting, they will always divert back to what's the past consequences I've experienced when I've reported, whether to child safety, to police or anyone else. They're weighing up. We often think women are proactive about their safety, but often I believe they are. And often stay, we know often isn't in the best interest of children. But I do believe women know how their partner's going to react. And, you know, I've had women say to me, you know, taking out a domestic violence order or reporting to police just is like a red rag to a ball. It's certainly going to make him worse. So we've got some questions around uh, resources that might be helpful. Um, so it may be difficult to engage you know, non-specialist staff or hospital staff to run tests or take things seriously when there's no visible injury. So are you aware of where people can access resources that might assist with that? The Red Rose Foundation website itself, we've put up some resources, but also the uh, Strangulation Institute web that I've put up their website. I'd encourage people to go to both of those. Um, if um, you're a non-medical professional, um, I think the best thing to be doing is having strangulation in your risk assessments that you would be doing with clients anyway. Um, maybe it's talking to women about, you know, has anyone ever put some hands on your throat? Do you know how dangerous this is? You know, I think you need to be getting some specialist support in it. I wouldn't be encouraging people that aren't 
trained in the, in the medical profession to be trying to do any interventions. I think it's about the referral, um, referral to uh, medical professionals, domestic violence specialist services um, and police. I think people need that general awareness that this is a very dangerous form of violence. Um, we need to be knowing how to have those conversations with women. But I think the best that we can do then is offer them really safe referrals. Okay, but there's a, and I might make these the last ones because we're running pretty close to time. Um, well, uh, several people have asked whether the slides will be available. So that's, <laughs> that's the first question. Um, unfortunately, no, the slides um, are part of a, a more broader training package that the Red Rose Foundation does. And as you could see, I was talking to those slides in, you know, adding a lot more content to them. But um, we will have information on our website and we'll add to that. And we will, you know, encourage people to go to the, um, the San Diego Training Institute. There's a lot of information there. Um, but we would encourage people to look at the two-day training as well because it is a lot more in-depth than what a 40-minute presentation can deliver. And of course, um, I'll just reiterate to everybody that this um, webinar is being recorded and will be available on the QCID for website in the next few weeks um, for people who want to access it later or share it with other work um, colleagues. So I can see that there's several of the questions there which I'll um, take down and we'll um, try to address later, but we are running on time there, so I might um, wrap things up. Thank you so much, Betty, for sharing all your knowledge with us today. Um, and thank you to all our uh, participants in the webinar who made the time to um, come and support it. I also want to thank Brisbane South PHN, uh, the Queensland Government and CQ University for their support in making this happen and uh, encouraging everyone to sign up to our mailing list, both to uh, be notified when the webinar is ready to um, view on our website, but also so you get notifications for our future webinars. We're, we've got our six month schedule already up and organized and there's lots of good content to come. So thank you very much, Betty, and thank you very much to everybody who attended today. Thank you, everyone.